Good morning again. When, uh, whenever I think of this story, I think of chaos. There are so many people um, reporting and everyone's scared and they're all in this house together and, and Thomas arrives, the disciples are telling Thomas what happened and, and, and Thomas can't believe it or, or won't believe it. I, I, whenever I think of this story, because of all that, I, I think of the words of, of Isaac Asimov when he said, you know, those people who think they know everything are a great annoyance to those of us who actually do. Um, we want to be sure, right? We want certainty in our lives, and it's easy to pretend that we do. Um, it, it's easy to know, uh, or to be a know-it-all, isn't it? Um, and it's a burden of, to us who are actually people who do know it all when there are know-it-alls around us. Um, we, you know, we're the ones who have it all figured out. Um, what I see in this story is that the life of faith is seeing, um, not looking, but seeing. And there's a difference between the two. Um, seeing is seeking to understand the reality of things beneath the surface. Maybe, uh, maybe that's what helps us to see in the dark places in life. Um, I don't even mean like figuratively. Anybody ever been in a dark room and not be able to see around you? Like especially when you're not familiar with like in a hotel or a new house or something. John uses light and darkness in that way to, to, to talk about understanding, uh, to, uh, to talk about seeing and not seeing uh, or to be in a place of ignorance. He's, he's always using light and darkness as an analogy that way. If you ever have woken up in an unfamiliar place, you know what that's like. I, I remember when I first moved here to Albuquerque, I woke up one of the first days I was here in the new house. And it was, I, I woke up early, earlier than I wanted to, but I thought, oh, I'm just gonna get up. It was still dark out. And in my old house, I would always uh, get out of, the, the door out from the bedroom was off to the right and a little bit forward. And so I just got up and was walking off to the right and a little bit forward. And, and that's where, like, there was a wall there in the new house. It, it was great. I wish you could have seen it. It was pretty funny to other people, it would have been at least. And that's kind of how life is, is life can be dark sometimes. Life can be tricky and confusing and even perplexing. Um, in life, we're all kind of just Thomases. We're also sort of feeling along. Sometimes we get a little bit ahead of ourselves or too sure of where we are. And I, I do think that's where Thomas is. So we start today right after the resurrection story, the text that we read just last week with Mary Magdalene. She finds the empty tomb, and, and she's a little bit perplexed by it, but eventually Jesus says her name and, and calls her name, and, and she sees. She, she perceives who Jesus is for the first time in that story. And, and other people, they're walking around in darkness, too. That she, Mary runs and, and gets Peter and the beloved disciple, and, and they're confused as things happen and, 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 and a little bit lost. And, uh, but Jesus appears and, and appears to the disciples and miraculously says, or miraculously appears and, and says, peace be with you. And, and knowing what the disciples are going through, Jesus does this for them. He shows them his wounds and, and he shows them the wound in his side. And, and, and it's, it's like he's letting them know that he is who he says he is. And then there's Thomas. And you, like I said last week, you know how we talk about Thomas in church. It's like he's worse than Hitler or something. I, I don't understand it. Thomas isn't even really his first name, right? What was Thomas's real first name? Doubting. Doubting. Yeah. <laughs> Doubting Thomas. So let's be fair. You know, Thomas, Thomas wasn't there at the empty tomb. He wasn't in the house when Jesus appeared for the first time. He comes and he hears secondhand uh, this witness of the resurrected Lord. And then Thomas responds in that infamous way with those infamous lines. If I will not believe until I see Jesus myself and I can examine his wounds and, and look at the evidence, place my hands in the wounds and, and place my hand in Jesus' side. I, I, I think Thomas... Maybe, if anything, he was born in the wrong time because we would understand Thomas a lot more today than we would in, the, in first century Judea, maybe. Because I think, in fact, I think Thomas would do just fine in today's world. He is just asking for evidence. We live in a scientific age today. Empirical evidence 
is the coin of the realm. And in fact, uh, it, it, that's not even a modern phenomenon. We should, we're told in our faith that we should be looking for evidence. In, in 1 John chapter 4, we're told to test the spirits, which is to say the questioning is not a bad thing. You're allowed to question here at church. You're allowed to question in the life of faith because faith is confusing sometimes. And it is perplexing sometimes. I think maybe the charitable reading of Thomas is the others were there to see for, him, for themselves what he had only heard about. Now, there is an issue because throughout John's, especially John's gospel, but maybe all the gospels, love and trust are signs of the community that, that Jesus is trying to build. It's, like, it's kind of like Jesus is trying to build a family. And, and so for Thomas, the words of his friends and his fellow disciples, they should be the people that he loves and trusts the most in this community that Jesus is trying to build. And this is important, this discussion, in a few ways. First of all, you have to look at the context that the Gospel of John was written in. Because, uh, I don't know if you know this, but John was written last among the four Gospels. It's one of the later books in the New Testament. And it's written in a time when the last of the disciples and the last of the early witnesses, the people who actually saw the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus said, this was, John was written right after the, probably after the last of those early witnesses had died and they were gone. That's a big paradigm shift. It, it would be, you know, in our families, you can all think of people who um, maybe remember this event or that event and, and it, it's hard when they start to, to, to to die and, and, and there's that collective memory that's lost, this is a very different community that John is writing to. Because instead of listening to eyewitness accounts, they are reading the words of what would become scripture, this, this witness of, of John's gospel. So I don't know how many people had become Christians, had come to Christ in the time up till then, maybe tens of thousands, but but this new community, they are living in the world we still live in today. If tens of thousands of people heard it firsthand from the people who saw it, we're among the billions upon billions of people who have found faith in Jesus, not by having seen, not by having heard for ourselves, but reading the testimony and the witness of others. So in many ways, the skepticism of Thomas is like this foreshadowing of the questions that anyone would ask as they first start to learn about Jesus from this new emerging community. And we do understand this today. We live, we're, we live in cynical times. So who are we to believe? Why should we believe these accounts of Jesus? Well, I think we should, and to tell you why, let me tell you a, a different story, um, a little bit more modern story. Um, early on, when I was uh, four or five years old, it was the 1980s, the early 80s. It was a dark time. <laughs> we didn't have screens and smartphones to keep our attention. So to pass the time, we had to converse with one another. And that's very difficult when you're four or five years old, because when you're four or five years old, most other people are very, very boring. And at the same time, we were some of the lucky ones in my family because we had something most people didn't. We had an Atari 2600 video game set. But don't be thinking that just because we had video games that we had the great life that people have today uh, because those games were very simple. My favorite game was Space Invaders, okay? Now, today's video games, for those of you who are younger, are, they're very different. They have, they have actual plot lines and stories to them. I was playing a game the other day. It had character developments in it. A character changed over the course of the game. And um, my favorite game in the 1980s was Space Invaders. You know what the plot line for Space Invaders is? Invaders are coming from space. That's <laughs> it. Okay, another good one was Pac-Man. In Pac-Man, you are a mouth and your whole job is to eat dots and ghosts are trying to eat you. That's, that's it, that's a whole story. And so I was bored with this and, and one day I found in my mom's closet, because I'm sure I was nosing around getting into stuff I shouldn't, um, or my dad's closet, one of the two, uh, this other Atari video game that they had hidden away in the closet. 
and I brought it to my mom and I said, what is this game? And, and I'm ser this is serious. She gave me this serious look and she said, holding the game, she's like, we don't play this game. This is a bad game, okay? Um, that game was called E.T. the Extraterrestrial for Atari 2600. And I should have listened to the testimony of my mom there and taken her word for it. Because it turns out my mom had a point. Because that game is not just a bad game. By her words, video game experts will tell you that that is the unofficial worst video game ever programmed. Um, it is a game so bad that it is blamed for something called the great video game crash of 1983, an industry-wide recession that nearly did video games in. They might never have existed. That may have been paradise, but we'll, we'll move on. There is, uh, in, in uh, E.T., the extraterrestrial video game, there's no plot. There's no point. You're just walking around as E.T., and you fall into holes, and you have to try to climb out of holes. It's very hard to do. Occasionally, you have to do stuff like put together a phone or things like that, but there's really no, you're just falling into holes the whole game. It was such a bad video game that people today will play it on YouTube, and I can't show you any of those videos of people playing that game because they all start cursing about three minutes in because they're so frustrated. And there's a church, we can't show videos like that. The game was rushed to stores in 1983 in time for the Christmas season, and it hadn't been tested enough. And this is where the urban legend of E.T. the video game begins. And, and here's how it goes. As copies of E.T. were returned after Christmas because people hated it so much, they were all collected in a warehouse, three quarters of a million of them. Warehouse in El Paso, Texas. So, and, and Atari was losing cash fast over this, and they told the manager of the warehouse, a man named Jim Heller, that he had to get rid of them. So in the dark of night, a crew loaded 14 tractor trailers with all of the copies of this video game and drove them off into the desert, the desert of New Mexico, <laughs> to Alamogordo, to the landfill there. And they dumped them there. And just to make sure that they never reared their ugly head again, Jim Heller also hired a cement truck to cover them in a tomb of cement. So the story goes, and stories become myth, and myths become legend, and rumors of the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad video game survived and, and were whispered about until 2014 when Atari enthusiasts got permission from the New Mexico Department of Public Health to excavate the game. They studied maps. They tried to pinpoint where within the landfill they would find it. And one April day in 2014, fans and other geeks turned out to watch the spectacle as excavators started digging for the game. This is what passes for entertainment in Alamogordo, New Mexico. <laughs> but they dug and they dug, and, and after some time, you know what they found? They found concrete. And then they got uh, jackhammers out and jackhammered through it and there they found thousands of copies of E.T., the extraterrestrial video game. The stories, the legends, the rumors were true. And all they recovered just over 2,000 cartridges that day. Some of them are in museums today. A lot of 900 of them sold for $108,000 on eBay. And the whole process was an act of faith. They had no documentation. Atari was out of business by then, and anyone from there wanted to forget about E.T. Um, and I tell you that because it's, it's a tried example, but I'm just telling you, how much of life do we miss if we sometimes, occasionally, won't step out in faith? Because you know what? We can't figure everything out. We don't know everything. I really hate that because I think I know everything. I know you're su surprised that I don't, but We're human. We're not God. Sorry. We have limitations. We're finite. And you know, when we come in our finite selves to the rough patches where we're low, and believe me, in this text, the disciples are low. They are struggling. Jesus rose from the dead, and they still have to hide. In those low places, what we have are the words of one another. We have each other, the, 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 and, and that matters. 
And, and, and not only do we have that, but we have the word of what we call uh, the great cloud of witnesses, all those people who came before us in the faith, including those who wrote what would become scripture through inspiration. We have that. That's that word of those came before us, that God is, that there's a God of love out there. And we need that, especially in the low places. We need to be told strange things like we have seen the Lord. I bet you can relate to this when I say there have been seasons of my life where I have had misgivings and been low as well. And, and let me just tell you, in those moments, I doubt. I am doubting Josh in those moments. And in those low times, the pain and the wounds and indeed the doubts that have blocked my vision where I've wondered and, and had a healthy or an unhealthy skepticism. And I've relied on others, on my family, on my friends, on my pastors, on church people. I've trusted their loving testimony. So when, and, and testimony when, that we have seen the Lord. When those times come and my own faith falters, I trust I will remain standing because hope lives here in this place, in the church. I lean on your hope when mine shakes. Anne Lamott, who you may have noticed is one of my favorite writers because I quote her all the time. She, she tweeted several months back on her, on her birthday um, and, and here's what she wrote. I love this. By the age of 68, I have come to realize only this, that the whole system of our lives works because we are not all nuts on the same day. <laughs> Which is true. And I love that. When I'm in a place of pain or brokenness, I will trust your sight and your ears and your words and your heart. I'll join my broken alleluia to your faithful alleluia. That'll be enough for me because if anyone cannot see the Lord, we can look upon each other and indeed see that Christ is in our midst. So let's trust in that. Let's all just be doubting St. John's people who lean on each other. And let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for our doubts because doubts, doubt is not this, the opposite of faith. That's certainty. Doubt is the fertile soil where faith can take root. So we thank you for our doubts, and we thank you for the faith which has been fruit of those doubts. Amen.